I shot my first duck at the age of seven at the mouth of the Blackbird Creek. I've loved it ever since. Endless salt marshes, historic farmlands, and deep forests. The Blackbird watershed is a unique, diverse natural habitat that has somehow gone virtually untouched and unnoticed by most Delawareans for hundreds of years. Located along the border of Kent and Newcastle counties, this ribbon of green surrounds its namesake, the Blackbird Creek, as it meanders from the Maryland border to Delaware Bay. Throughout its slow journey, from mature upland forests to vast tidal marshes, the Blackbird Creek is buffered by some of the most unspoiled natural habitat on the Delmarva Peninsula. It's one of the last pristine river systems that we have in Delaware. It has been protected so far, and the environmental quality of it is so high, you just can't find any other place like that in Delaware. That area down there, the Taylor's Bridge area south, contains one of the finest examples of coastal salt marsh anywhere on the East Coast. Relatively unspoiled, a good example of what it used to be like. Just great salt marsh habitat. The salt marsh habitat at the mouth of Blackbird Creek is just one of a number of distinct high quality natural environments found along its corridor. Part of the reason for this diversity is due to how the Blackbird was formed. During the last ice age, when sea level was 100 feet lower, coastal rivers and streams, including the Blackbird, cut into the land to form broad, deep valleys. As the sea level rose, these valleys flooded and developed first into freshwater swamps and then salt marshes. This explains why the Blackbird Creek meanders and why it is surrounded by extensive buffering wetlands and also perhaps why it was never altered. A lot of rivers in Delaware have been straightened where the uh, blackbird has not, so you get a lot more twisting and turning in it, so that adds to the distance. But the actual saltwater influence is a lot shorter than a lot of estuaries here in uh, central Delaware because of the way it's formed and because of the heavy uh, freshwater influence at its headwaters. Those headwaters can be found in Blackbird State Forest, one of the few large forested areas left on the Delmarva Peninsula. We've lost 80% of our forests in Delaware, so even if you look at this place on an aerial photograph, um, with the, or even just on a map with the forests in green, uh, you can see, you can see this corridor. It shows up. There are only a couple places in Delaware and even on the Delmarva that show up like that, so it really makes it unique. This large, mature forest not only ensures clean headwaters for the blackbird, it supports one of the most unusual wetland habitats on Earth, the coastal plain pond, or Delmarva Bay. These forest ponds, filled only for part of the year, support frogs, salamanders, and other life forms found only on the Delmarva Peninsula, and only where there is habitat clean enough to support their unique survival needs. Through the years, the qualities of the Blackbird watershed have not only provided good habitat for plants and animals, but have also limited its development. Remote from the bigger cities and often wet for much of the year, the Blackbird attracted only a hardy few. It was traditionally either wilderness or uh, agricultural areas, or areas where people would go to get away from it all. You know, it was so rural that that's what drew folks to Blackbird. Farmers, loggers, trappers, and hunters. Many of those drawn to the blackbird quickly realized its value and wisely respected the resources and habitat they depended on. Part of the reason why it still is the way it is is because of generations of good stewardship, uh, mostly from farming families and woodsmen who have lived in this corridor over time. The Blackbird's natural riches encouraged early settlers to stay. Families like the Dukes of Taylor's Bridge thrived 
with successive generations acquiring more land, assuring the preservation of both the resource and their way of life. We can trace it back to 1730, the original land, but in 1730, my ancestors bought more land, so they were here and settled, we figure, around 1600. They had been involved with the Hudson Bay Fur Company, so when they came down and saw the Delaware marshes with all the muskrat houses, that was really a drawing card. There have been very few new neighbors come in. It's been the same families who have grown up there into their third, fourth generation of family that's still living on their property. Over the years and through many generations, the Dukes have cultivated and cherished their special relationship with the Blackbird. We've always made our living from the land, and the marsh was just a part of the life. Uh, in the winter, we would uh, trap, and in summer, we'd go boating. We'd go down to the river shore where the blackbird comes out and goes swimming. We'd ride our bicycles as kids, and it was just part of our life, and it's part of the farm. Such local stewardship meant that much of the blackbird remained pristine well into the 20th century and unchallenged by development. The land's not available because those of us who are here aren't interested in selling any of it. As you saw with the, the battle with Shell, we, we hung in there too well trying to preserve what the heritage represented there. Forty-five years later, the battle with Shell stands as one of the defining events in the Blackbird's history and the history of environmental protection in Delaware. Shell came in and started buying up land for the eventual purpose of building a refinery. And there were people down there who were for it, and there were people down there against it. And uh, one of the early people against it was a farmer named Jack Dukes, who still lives there. We had the representative who came and sat right here at the table with us and drank coffee and ate sticky buns and told us how he grew up eating muskrat and doing all these same things, but he was going to make life better for us. <laughs> Others felt differently, and the Dukes, in their outspoken desire to protect the blackbird, became lightning rods for public opinion. Some of it got pretty rough down there. There was one thing where somebody put a diagonal spike in a field to catch Jack's combine when he went through uh, to damage his combine. Well, it could have killed him. Yet the Dukes and their supporters also attracted those interested in saving this little-known watershed, including Delawareans for Orderly Development, the Delaware Wildlife Federation, and Delaware Wild Lands. Our role was to carefully pick out and buy key areas to checkerboard and try to keep Shell from getting one great big piece. All that was was a slowing tactic. It, we knew that that wouldn't be enough in its own uh, to, to prevent it. Despite enormous odds, the Dukes and others generated enough support to attract the attention of Delaware's governor and save the Blackbird with the passage of the Coastal Zone Act. You can imagine how much power had to come from the people in order to make this happen. With all those powerful interests, our State Chamber of Commerce, nearly every law firm in Delaware being hired and assigned to work on this project, and the labor unions, with the exception of UAW, all fighting to uh, make it happen. And the people were able to convince people in government uh, that they had to pass this act in order to save the place. Mm -hmm.